Okay, so hello and welcome to the Integrative Health Quint Convention 2018 online interviews. Today we're going to find out a bit more about Qigong and John Miller, who is speaking at the uh, convention this October at the Park Plaza in London. So the Integrative Health Convention is an annual convention in London featuring many leaders in, their in the fields of complementary and conventional medical therapies to help people get better through various healing practices. It's an opportunity for doctors and therapists to meet and the public as well who are interested in this to learn, to share, to connect with each other because we believe that true health is holistic and that people get better in more than just one way and that we all have so much to learn from each other and that integrate, the Integrative Health Convention provides a stage for therapists, doctors, and the public just to begin to do this. So there are limited tickets available, which can be purchased on our website at the integrativehealthconvention.co.uk. So this series of online interviews will help you get to know our speakers, who are the leaders in different uh, fields of healing and therapy or medicine, and maybe help you decide on which talk to attend out of the 36 talks to choose from over two days at the Integrative Health Convention. So I'm your host, Dr. To Wong. I've been a doctor for 17 years and a GP for the last 12 years in Devon. I'm the co-founder of Neurolinguistic Healthcare, who are the organizers of the Integrative Health Convention. Neurolinguistic Healthcare provides courses in advanced communication, communication skills and therapeutic techniques, as well as training in hypnosis for healthcare providers. So today I'm speaking to one of our excellent speakers who's coming to the 2018 Integrative Health Convention at the Park Plaza Victoria this October to share with you what they know and to tell us a little bit about who they are, what they do and what to expect from their talk at the convention. So this is John Miller, who is a Qigong practitioner and teacher, which help, uh, and uh, he helps people and therapists in Qigong to go deeper into the practice of Qigong and to qualify as teachers of Qigong and uh, information about his website called Three Monkeys Qigong uh, and the spelling of all this can be found on the, uh, the links of the, on the speaker profile, which I'll link to the video um, description below. So, um, hi, John. Hi, Chuck. Should we, begin, hi. Should we begin by letting our audience know a little bit more about yourself? Uh, any anything that I didn't cover? Um, I don't think there's an awful lot that you haven't covered. Um, it's probably worth saying something about what Qigong is, uh, because it's described as lots of different things. Um, uh, quite a lot of people within the Tai Chi community have only come across it as the warm up for Tai Chi, um, but it's actually a far bigger system, uh, and it it's a way of connecting body and mind. Um, the history of it goes back thousands of years. Uh, and it potentially was one of the things that started traditional Chinese medicine. It's certainly one of the pillars of traditional Chinese medicine. Um, but it's also sits, it also sits within the martial arts traditions. And so, for example, the Shaolin monks, what they do is considered to be Qigong. That's not what, we, that's not what, what we're doing at the conference. There's no spears involved. Um, but it's also closely related to some of the spiritual traditions as well. So you see it in certain forms of Buddhism, you see it within Taoist traditions. And so it's a, it's a very wide subject area. Um, but the piece that we're going to be looking at is the healing work that can be done within the practice. I see, yeah, good. So I'm always curious about what things, uh, what brings someone to be interested in their field in health in healing uh, in the practice of qigong can you tell me how you got interested in what you do and the story behind how you uh, started started it up and getting into it and what you're doing now okay um i actually I, I i sort of blame my stepfather in many ways um he was he was a minister in the church so i was brought up as uh with uh, with christianity very central within uh the family life and there was something for me that didn't quite work with christianity um and so what happened was the as my uh, stepfather was dying we had this amazing conversation where he said you've got to find your own path he said christianity was the closest path for him to his belief system and it was the best vehicle for him but he recognized that i needed to find a, a vehicle that was slightly different and so I started studying world religions 
Um, I'd always had an interest in sort of alternative things. And through a process of looking at quite a large number of religions and looking at the commonalities between them, mm -hmm. um, I ended up talking to people who were involved in healing. And I, first of all, came to uh, one healing practice that was called Sananda and started looking at this and then through Reiki. And it was it was my first real Reiki teacher who turned around to me and said, um, not convinced that Reiki is the thing for you, um, but Qigong looks like it would be a really good fit. And he showed me some basic work around it. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And then within maybe a couple of months, we had this uh, Tibetan Buddhist teacher come to the local town to teach. Who uh, He spoke no English at all. Um, and he was just this astonishing teacher. And so immediately there was an opportunity. And I went and studied with him. Really got the bug. And then I think it's one of those things that once you start to get interested in something, you start to notice it in all kinds of places. Um, and so I then went on to study elemental Qigong um, and qualified to teach in elemental Qigong uh, before then going, I want to know what's behind this system and digging deeper into, into the traditions. Along the way, I think it's now seven different forms of Qigong I, I'd studied before I came to something called Jineng Qigong, which um, it was the first form that I'd come to where I'd met teachers that I felt I really wanted to find out what was really going on for them, and it was going to take a significant amount of time. Um, and there's such depth within the Jining Qigong field, and there's also such flexibility within it, which is which is um, sometimes unusual within the more traditional forms. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to adapt the form. So if I go and work in businesses, it's very easy to work with businesses with it. It's very easy to right. work one to one with people or with large groups. Um, it's it's got far, far more flexibility and as i say the the people that i've worked with have just demonstrated so much more depth of practice so mm. um yeah in 2010 i stopped my normal work which was in it but we'll leave that one to one side and um went full time with the qigong and we set up the three monkeys school a couple of years later uh which was designed to actually start to train people up uh, to teach um, and to be fully qualified, fully insured teachers. Uh, and we were very lucky in that we were able to work closely with centers in China in order to develop the course and in order to offer additional training. And so that's where I am now. We're, we're running this amazing school. We've got a community of people that are building up behind us. Uh, and I'm also going out and working with strange and unusual groups of people doing things that I'd never imagined I would be. Such as? Um, I think the most extreme one in recent years was uh, working with the uh, working in the Middle East with the military in the Middle East, um, oh. using Qigong in order to help develop leadership strategies. Um, mm. I'm not convinced that they realised what they were buying when they asked me to go out there, but it was it was five days that was um, absolutely fascinating because quite a lot of the practice. Um, in, in the traditions that they have out there is very quickly classified as magic. And magic is not only illegal uh, in Saudi Arabia, it's also punishable by death. So, <laughs> so, so, so you suddenly have to find a way to actually put the work across in a way that becomes that much more acceptable and people can see the sense of what's going on behind it instead of what can sometimes be seen as the sort of more mystical aspects. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, and then last year I was working with some of the world's top nuclear physicists in the south of France, um, again, looking at communication skills and leadership. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you, I end up going to some quite unusual places with it, as well as the pure Qigong work as well. Gosh, so it sounds like you're perfectly with, uh, integrative approach. I... I it, it's it certainly it certainly feels that way it's been a bit of a baptism by fire by walking into um the, the senior levels of, la of, of of large companies and and allowing yourself to be shot down allowing your practice to be really pulled apart and then finding ways to communicate the bits that are beneficial um and it's that is that um translation of the practice into into western language into something that is more culturally acceptable that i think is really exciting and so, uh, yeah, it, but it's still the same practice. It's just the words and the descriptions change slightly. 
So you, and you're going to give us a talk uh, about Qigong at the um, at uh, at the convention in October. Can you tell us a bit more about the topic and what the audience will gain out of it? Well, I've chosen to climb on one of my favorite soapboxes, um, which is about cycles of suffering. <clears throat> uh, there's a bit of a personal story behind it, um, because in um, 2010, I was diagnosed with work-related stress. So this doesn't sound like an advert for Qigong. Um, and when I went to see the GP, uh, the GP asked about my work situation. And when I explained it, they said, and how many weeks have you been in this situation? And I said, well, almost four years. <sighs> Um, and, and and she said, you must be doing something amazing to, to actually put up with this for four years. And I'm sitting there thinking, I must be doing something stupid to put up with this for four years. Yeah. And what I realized was happening was that my personal practice at that point was between an hour and two hours every day of Qigong. And I do this practice in order to cope with a very, very difficult work situation. Mm -hmm. um, and inadvertently, I'd taken something that was incredibly powerful, as in a, a, a Qigong practice. And the only reason that I did it was to keep paying the bills. Uh, yeah. And so it means you can put up with more and more stress. It means you can carry on being in this cycle where things just keep building up and keep building up because you've got a really good tool to cope with it. But at some point, I described the sensation as a bit like you're, you're putting a heavy weight on one side of a seesaw in the morning. During the day, you put a heavy weight on the other side of the seesaw. And over time, these things balance. But then as the weights get heavier, suddenly they start to they start to crack. They start to break. Yeah. I think so, in, in medicine, you call that burnout, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's, yeah, I, I, I'd say that was probably exactly that. Um, mm -hmm. What I became interested in is, firstly, how had I got it so wrong? And secondly, how could I have actually changed my uh, approach so that that didn't happen? Um, and so what the cycles of suffering piece is about is how can you actually um, use a practice such as Qigong, which it's not about taking an hour every morning and an hour, hour every evening. It's how do you take aspects of the practice, something that's small and accessible, but nobody will ever see you do it and integrate that into your daily life. And so the Qigong practice is now no longer just an hour in the morning. The Qigong practice is something that effectively sits there 24 hours a day and means that when things occur, you are far better capable of bringing yourself out of the stress responses with all the associated internal chemicals rushing around the body and bring yourself back into more of a, into more of a parasympathetic response. Yes. Where, where everything in the body is is coming back into balance far more quickly, um, and, and it's breaking the cycles of uh, suffering. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, and, and, and on, on in the in the hour when you give your talk, you you'll have some techniques that uh, that the um, uh, delegates are are able to take with them. Uh, absolutely, some of the techniques that we use are so incredibly simple that anybody can do them. Um, and so within the talk, what we'll be looking at will not only be the techniques, but also trying to apply the techniques. So trying to put ourselves into slightly different scenarios and seeing how the technique affects that scenario and, mm -hmm. and starting to building a level and starting to build a level of trust in, in the ideas that we're working with. And so the delegates can then go out and try them in the real world. And through that experience, they're then more, they're then more capable of, share, of sharing them with others because they can speak from a, from a place of experience. It's amazing. So having thought about the Integrative Health Convention and where the audience will be made up of doctors, therapists and the public, where do you see your particular practice fitting in with integrative health? Perhaps some people would call it holistic health. You know, a bit of this, a bit of that. And that's what inclusive health. Uh -huh. um, I think for me, there are sort of two ways in which it fits. Um, there's a number of other therapists that I've worked with over time. And depending on the therapy, people uh, are more open to sharing ideas from other areas. Some therapies are very strict about you can only actually practice this particular thing. Um, but some of the techniques that we use, some of the breathing and movement techniques that we use are so simple that once somebody's actually gone and tried it and they've found benefit in it, they are then free to actually share it with other people and talk about their benefit. 
Um, and so these aren't my techniques. They're not copyrighted. They're just things that we can share with each other to make each other's lives just that much bit better. And so that so there's that aspect of it, which is sort of take it, use it, please. It, it, it's a gift. Um, and, and the other aspect is the question of how can you integrate Qigong into other practices? So how, mm -hmm. how can you use a Qigong professional within your practice? Uh, and this, again, is quite an interesting question because Qigong itself, as with all the systems, are complete systems. Um, and you can find different ways to work on different levels. So there was uh, a number of people that I've worked with. You get this scenario that um, a, a, a child, well, I say a child, um, somebody maybe in their mid-40s will have a parent who is not well. And they've been along to the class and they go, this is an amazing thing. I wish my I, I wish my parent would take it on. And so they then pay for the parent to come along and do a one to one session with you. And mm -hmm. so the first thing that you ask is about whether they've come here of, of their own free will. And the answer is nearly always no in that situation. Uh -huh. And so you then say, well, are, are you interested in this? And generally, the answer that comes back is, well, sort of. And you go, well, that well sort of means that the full practice of Qigong is not going to be something that is going to be useful to you. But then you can look at doing things, for example, you, you can ask questions about how do people relate to regular meds that they're taking? Mm -hmm. And quite often what you get is this piece about, I hate taking my meds, it reminds me that I'm ill. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then you can start to use the Qigong practice to change their relationship with their meds. Mm. And so that that action that they do every morning or every day where they're, where they're taking medication or they're doing something because of their condition, don't do it because you have the condition. Do it because this will help to make the condition better. Mm. And, and whenever you do this type of work, you always see big improvement or, or you always hear back from the generally from the children saying that there's been such a massive improvement in, in the parent who's actually come and done this. Um, but it's just about changing the mindset about the way that you interact with things. And so that, to me, integrates with all kinds of things. We're improving. It's quite possible. And the idea of a 24-hour the, the monitor of blood pressure sounds, sounds perfect because actually that is a, that's pointing at, you know, what is actually going on for the person. And, it, and it's building trust in that, you know. And then if they can turn around to the family and say, actually, look, this is the results then they can mm. be free of things. So, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's about using everything that's available to you. And one of the things that we're always uh, told about within the Xineng Qigong is about the idea of getting getting people who you've been working with to actually go back and get the medical tests. Mm -hmm. It's not about separating yourself from a particular approach. It's about using things that will build trust and prove to the individual that everything is normal again. Good. So, very interesting. So, uh, John, I'm asking one particular extra question as a therapist or teacher with years of experience under your belt. What do you think in particular is the key to healing in what you do? So I'm looking for something personal to what you do and that you think makes, makes the most difference. Um, I think to me, probably the biggest thing is that I don't do anything to the person or for the person. What I do mm. is I give them a tool that they can use themselves, um, which means that people become responsible for their own healing. Um, mm. that's, a far, that's a far more powerful place to be uh, because it means that you then can take control. You can recognize just how amazing things are and you don't have that level of dependence that you may, that you may have on... Um, other practices or other um, strategies. Um, and so it means that I can work just once with somebody. And from then, they can then go and do amazing things. Um, and there's no need to do a course of treatment quite often. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a really bad business model, if I'm honest. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, yeah. an amazing, it's an amazing way to work. Um, especially when you get people coming back maybe three months later uh, and reporting just astonishing results. 
and not actually crediting me with the work, crediting themselves with the work. Um, Isn't that amazing? I find that's, that's, you know, that would be, I, you know, if we could only do that, you know, I don't know if you know the funding structure in general practice, we get a, we get a flat fee per person per year. So the fewer times someone gets to see us, the, the more profitable it is for us. So it is in our interest. I mean, no, general practice in this country is funded so well. I mean, it's a, it's a blessing that they, they do pay us this way because, you know, we have an incentive to make people better in a shorter time as possible. And, you know, what you said is so valuable and you're mm. right you know it's so much more rewarding when when people have done it themselves or, or credit themselves for it yeah yeah and 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 i'm sure you as a you as a doctor will will recognize how exhausting it can be to keep coming back and keep coming back um that's right on, and, ju and just having that ability to reduce that exactly. yeah mm. it's a blessing absolutely. absolutely it doesn't always work <laughs> No, There's, no, of course, but I, I like to believe that some miracles are better than no miracles. <laughs> oh, um, oh um, absolutely. I, I, I think it always comes down to, certainly within the practice of Qigong, it comes down to the level of trust that you can, you can establish with the person that that particular thing is going to make the difference for them. Um, and ge generally, you can do it in one session. But sometimes you'll find that it'll be over the course of a few, t uh, of a few sessions that people will start to understand how effective things can be for them. Qigong sounds absolutely fascinating and, uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, listening to your talk. Of course, I won't be able to attend all 36 talks, so, but uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll be hoping to video everything so that everyone can ha have a look at it later on. So, uh, but uh, I'm so excited about it. So, so thank you for taking the time to talk to me and to, um, uh, let us know about more about this talk and thank you for, to the audience for watching and listening to this interview uh, and, and choosing this one from all the other interviews out there so re remember to get your tickets uh, early from our website before they're all sold out they're, they are limited unfortunately um, and you can follow one of the links below in the description and uh, so we are the Integrative Health Convention in London on the 13th, 13th and 14th of October 2018 so you can use the discount code as a gift, uh, and I'll put it down, podcast10, uh, all in one word, which will give you a 10% discount as a gift from us to you for sharing your time with us. So we hope to see you up in uh, October in London, and our speakers will be sharing much more with you then. And... Uh, and so we'll be able to you'll be able to have a chance to see John in person. Thank you very much.